Okay, I think we are now live. Uh, this is the House Health Care Committee, and it's Tuesday, February 22nd, uh, one in the afternoon. And um, okay, there's some kind of feedback. Okay, just getting our technology sorted out here. Okay, we're all set with that? Okay. Great. Okay, well, uh, welcome to the House Healthcare Committee, uh, Heidi. Um, we're pleased to have you join us this afternoon. Uh, and we, as you know, have been trying addressing the issue of health, uh, health disparities in Vermont. And as a part of that, want to continue to follow the work of the Department of Health. And last week we heard from the uh, Commission on Health Disparities. Um, and my understanding is that, and part of what we're interested in hearing about is uh, the work that the Department of Health is doing. And my understanding is that there's a significant federal grant that the department was successful in uh, applying for. Uh, and that, so I'm hoping that you can give us an update information on that grant and the work that will follow that's perhaps happening already and the work that will follow from the grant and uh, how it relates to the other initiatives around health disparities uh, that are moving forward in Vermont. So with that, welcome. Great, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> For those I haven't met before, my name is Heidi Klein. I serve in the Commissioner's Office, uh, Commissioner of Health, as Director of uh, Planning and Healthcare Quality. I've been here for about five years in this position. Uh, and so what I'm going to share with you is how we are working uh, pre-COVID to try and address health disparities, what happened during COVID, and most importantly, really hone in on this uh, opportunity that we have through uh, a CDC health disparities grant that was specifically um, given to the health department due to what we were seeing um, as the same in other parts of the country in terms of the disproportionate impact of COVID on uh, populations of color in particular and in rural populations. So I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. I think I'm allowed to, let's try. And. Uh where we'll assist you in giving you that I don't think, I don't think her presentation is on our committee page yet. There's nothing on it. It is not. It has not been sent. It's not been sent. Okay, okay so, but can you see my screen? Yeah, hi. we can see your screen. Is it possible that the, I don't know if that's possible at this point in time, but it's helpful to our committee to actually be able to see, uh, to have the presentation also available on our committee web page so that oh sure sure i didn't send it now because i figured there were, you were probably going to ask questions and then i could make a, a couple of revisions before i gave it to you but i'm happy to make sure you have it is that possible uh i don't know i i'm not knowledgeable enough to know whether that's something that can just happen now or if that should happen later yeah, is that is that something that could be sent, Heidi? Sure. Hold on. Let me see. Um, yeah. Let me. Loud. I mean, I mean, my ears seem as though they're bleeding, but probably are. Oh. But it's not. Well, it it seems a little loud to me. But mm -hmm. okay. It is. Yeah. Okay. I am just. Uh, I got the meeting invitation through a couple I, of I, other I, people. I'm sorry, we're just having some technical issues right here. If, if, while you try to send us your presentation, I'm going to talk with the committee about a couple of things. Okay. We, uh, just, if that's okay, I apologize for doing this. When we last were here, the end of last week, there was a sound that was coming from the mm -hmm. speaker in the center of the table. That it, when, when loud, particularly when it got loud, it kind of vibrated. It was quite annoying to I think many people experienced that. IT came in at the end of the day Friday, and they said what they would try doing instead was moving to the speakers that are in the screen. 
And I think that's what we're experiencing as different today, mm -hmm. that it's a different set of speakers. So it, it's coming into the room differently. And it may also be, uh, it may, it may, the volume maybe needs to be adjusted and, and we'll have, need to figure out how to have it work well for everybody in the room. So I don't know how we control that or if we do. Yes. Previously, I think it was controlled from a console that is at. Uh, oh, we have a clicker? <laughs> well, it's <laughs> that thing right there, probably. Yes. Uh, never mind. Then. I don't want to. But that's but we. Yes, it, I, I've had yeah. a little left. Yeah. yeah. We'll just point to you and say you broke it. My fault. <laughs> so if it continues to be bothersome, we'll go and ask IT to come in and help adjust, yeah. because they're just down the hall, and and they've been very responsive. Okay, so were you able to? Were we able to receive the report or the the slide deck? So I sent it to Claire. Is Claire in the room and able to receive it? Claire is right here. Yeah, and the audio is much better. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry, sorry. We're 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 still adjusting to our new world, Heidi. And uh, I was amazed to see you all in there and figuring out how to have multiple computers open at the same time because we haven't figured that out yet either. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to sort out here, and. Uh, Emailed it to you all, and then I'll work on posting it. Okay, do you hear that, folks? Yep. So Claire has emailed it to everyone, but she'll okay. also work on posting it to the um, website so people can access it that way as well. Okay, thank you, Heidi, for helping us take that. Uh, um, absolutely. And um, if we could, you know. Uh, Claire, I'll work with you if there's anything that changes or we want to update for what gets posted on the website. Um, if there's additional information, that would be helpful. Okay. We, you could do an update. That, that would be fine too. Okay. Beautiful. So let's, all right. let's, let's start again. <laughs> Great. Hello, all. <laughs> and I think I had the pleasure of meeting many of you last year um, when you were first considering the development of... Um, what would be most supportive in advancing our needs to address health equity in the state of Vermont. Um, and at that time, I was completely head down in our, um, our HOC, meaning our Health Operations Center, uh, COVID response. Um, and so what I am happy to say is that since that time, we have been able to secure a CDC health disparities grant specific to COVID and the um, disparities we are seeing in our COVID impact in communities of color in particular and in some of our rural um, communities. I did not prepare any presentation on that. What I'm gonna tell you about right now is just about um, this grant opportunity and what our plans are uh, and how it connects to work that we were doing pre-pandemic and how we hope it will help serve us post-pandemic. But right now we are still very much uh, in pandemic, particularly with the populations that have been uh, disproportionately impacted. So let me see if this is gonna work. So can you now see a full slide that says grant overview, link to the state health improvement plan and then the strategies? Perfect, thank you, Representative Burroughs. I see your face nodding, that's very helpful feedback, thank you. Um, so this is what I plan to present on. Um, I'll probably move a little fast. Um, so the grant overview, this is a CDC health disparities grant. The official name is the National Initiative to Address COVID-19 Health Disparities Among Populations at High Risk and Underserved, Including Racial and Ethnic Minority Populations and Rural Communities. CDC prepared uh, and gave funding to all states for this work, plus some local health departments. Uh, they gifted this to us uh, before we were ready to receive it. So the timeline was June 1st through uh, 2021 through May 31st, 2023. Right now we have no assurance, but we are very much hoping that there will be a no cost extension. Um, and the reason I say this is while CDC technically made the funding available to us on June 1st, we were not able to access this funding before November 1st. Uh, because of the joint fiscal requirements and the fact that this funding included uh, the creation of a few new positions. So we were only given spending authority starting November 1st. The total budget is uh, $28 and a half million dollars. 
I want to put this plan in context a little bit for you. Um, and because I think it's really Im important to recognize that before COVID hit, and this is how we sort of planned to um, our thinking around the funding that was coming in. Before COVID hit, we had um, undertaken what we call our state health assessment and our state health improvement plan, the SHA and the SHIP. And in that, we had identified that there were certain populations, we call them populations in focus, where if we looked at all of our data across all health outcomes, health behaviors, and wellness, we saw consistently that there were certain populations that were experiencing poorer health and lesser access, um, and that we plan to work upstream. Well, then COVID, we were, you know, had just published the, the state health improvement plan beginning on our work to really dig in across the state. So the health improvement plan is not just for the health department, but it's for the whole state and includes multiple agencies and partners. And then COVID hit. And, and what we found was so not uh, any surprise, which is that COVID-19 actually um, further demonstrated and intensified many of the health disparities across Vermont, um, and that it contributed to deepening isolation and inequities within communities. And so all of the communities that we had been seeing previously impacted where um, health disparities were exacerbated. Um, and um, it was as if COVID just was shining a bright spotlight on what we had seen before and now has made visible what was perhaps underlying before in terms of certain communities being more impacted by negative health outcomes and under-resourced and the ability to access wellness. So we started with this on the ship, we saw what COVID happened, and then we had this great uh, learning, this great opportunity through the CDC grant. And these are the four areas of work in the CDC grant, uh, resources and service, data improvement, public health infrastructure, and investments in community partners. I'm gonna walk you through what we're doing. But I wanted to just give you this background so that you understood we were building on the past as we move forward, because we hope whatever we do in terms of using this funding and using this, let's call it opportunity of COVID, it should be helping us think about long-term change. So I quickly wanna just share with you, this was um, from our state health assessment and state health improvement plan, that this is how we were thinking about health inequities um, because we were trying to say of all Vermonters, which populations are most uh, affected by poor health outcomes. And what we discovered, not surprisingly, is that those who've experienced socioeconomic disadvantage, historical injustice, and other unavoidable inequities that are often associated with social category of race, gender, ethnicity, social position, sexual orientation, and disability. Um, these are exactly the same populations that are called out in the CDC health disparities grant of the um, focus for the, the work that we could do using the CDC grant. This is history, but just so I wanna give you a little bit of history, you can see this is from our state health assessment and state health improvement plan. When we looked at which populations were most impacted, here they are. The populations that were most of concern were our BIPOC. So our black indigenous people of color and our English language learners, our LGBTQ, people who are living with disabilities and people living in poverty. We identified that the health conditions, those that were the, that, uh, were the highest, in, um, where we were seeing the most impact and opportunity for change were child development, chronic disease, mental health, oral health, substance use disorder, and that the conditions, those social conditions of most import uh, were housing, transportation, food, income, and economic stability. You could put here, instead of the state health assessment priorities, the health condition COVID-19, and it would be exactly the same in the left column, meaning the populations that have been most impacted and the social conditions that have made it so much harder for these populations to stay well. I'm not even gonna pretend to share this. This is history, but for those of you who might need a refresher, our state health improvement um, plan when we came up with the strategies we wanted to work on, it was about investing in policies and infrastructure to create healthy communities. These are social determinants of health. Investing in programs that promote resilience, connecting, and belonging. Those are all about early childhood, mental health, substance use, 
investments for wellness and then expanding access to integrated person-centered care. Um, this has in intensified in the time of COVID that we really see that. The other thing that I really wanna to call to your attention is at the bottom here, there's this underlying strategy that we said was most important and that was about adopting organizational and institutional practices that advance equity. And that's really aimed at us in state government um, as well as our healthcare partners that these are the ways in which we have to have meaningful community engagement, equitable programs, policies, budgets, respectful care and services, and informed action and decisions. I would say that our work in coming up with the CDC disparities grant is completely informed by this lower one, exactly the same. Um, this is our public health framework. I love this. I would be happy to spend an entire day talking to you about this. Um, this was our way of trying to show that improving public health, but in addressing health disparities and inequities is far beyond the work of just the health department. Because while the health department and public health tends to be in this zone, right? We tend to focus on risk behaviors, disease and injury and mortality. This is our primary zone, right? Of prevention that in fact, what matters equally or more in terms of promoting health equity and addressing in long-term sustainable inequities are what's happening at this further upstream by addressing living conditions, institutional inequities, and then social inequities. So when we embark on what do we need to do in terms of uh, changing the curve on COVID-19 or changing the curve on health disparities in the state of Vermont, we believe that it is necessary for us as a state to be working in the zones further to the left, which are further upstream. Public health can share our data. We can do our parts here around health education, health care, um, and civic engagement and policy, but we really need to be working across government and across sector. All right, I'm gonna go round us back again into the, um, the grant. I just thought it was really helpful for you to know we were building on some work that had been done before. COVID was no surprise to us in terms of what was needed. Um, and so what we have learned by COVID is relearning some of what we learned before. And we are hoping to use the, this short-term two-year funding to invest in ways that help us not only address COVID, but perhaps if we can build some sustainability long-term. So the intended grant outcomes I was very, very clear that it be focused among populations at higher risk and that are underserved, including racial and ethnic minority groups and people who are living in rural communities. There were three goals or outcomes according to CDC, the first being reducing COVID-related health disparities. Second, improving and increasing testing and contact tracing. So again, very COVID-specific. And then third, uh, the outcome was to improve state, local, U.S. territorial, and freely associated state health department capacity and services to prevent. Um, it is very rare that the health department gets a capacity building grant. Um, what you may have seen uh, and what we have certainly experienced is that public health was severely under-resourced and under, um, understaffed when the pandemic hit, we had just come out of multiple years of layoffs and or holding on positions. Um, and so we did not have the state health capacity, uh, the state health department capacity we needed. So you will see that this is one of the goals is to get the state health department back up to that ability so we can be effective on behalf of our communities. Um, there are four different strategies that CDC outlines that are expected within the use of the CDC grant. So one is, I think this will look familiar, resources and services, data collection and reporting, infrastructure, and then community partnerships. This is a very high level breakdown of how we were conceptualizing um, the breakdown of activities and funding that we received and how we would spread it across. So what you'll see here is uh, the resources and services are about expanding existing and or new and or develop new mitigation and prevention resources and services specific to COVID-19. 
The second is about data collection and reporting, and it's really about increasing or improving data collection and reporting for populations experiencing disproportionate burden of COVID-19. The third is the infrastructure, building, leveraging, and expanding infrastructure to support COVID-19 prevention and control. And then the last one is community partnership, mobilizing partners and collaborators to advance health equity and address the social determinants of health. So this is how we sort of looked at it all along um, in the way that we broke it down. So um, one of the things that I will point out to you, because I know this is of concern is um, how much are we using internally versus how much of the funding is going out externally. And I'll, I'll just have you know that uh, both the resources and services and the community partnership bu buckets are almost all going out in various um, grants or agreements with community-based partners and service agencies. Um, so that is funding that we are intending to put out in community in order to ensure that we are all working together and that this um, is really addressing the needs of those communities that have been most impacted. I'm gonna take you through a very quick tour. Someone should give me a time if I uh, need to speed up, okay? Because what I'm gonna do, if it makes sense, is I have one slide for each of these four strategies so I can tell you a bit more in detail. Does that work for you? It works, yep. Okay, fabulous. All right, so um, strategy one was to expand mitigation and prevention services. So there are a couple of things that we have really looked at that we needed to continue our current response. And so the first area was strengthening and expanding the community partnerships activated during the COVID response. We were able to work very hard and, and quick by state standards to fund some essential community-based partners to help us in setting up testing clinics, setting up vaccine clinics, doing community outreach and education. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we had funding to support those essential partners who um, have been absolutely a mainstay in ensuring that we reach those, uh, um, the BIPOC, ELL, and uh, rural communities. We also put aside some funding. We're hoping to expand mental health substance use and suicide prevention supports for these communities. Um, so as you have probably seen, um, while all eyes were focused on COVID, meaning the infectious disease, we have seen also a tremendous increase uh, in need around mental health substance use and suicide prevention, right? These are the, the corollary impacts of COVID. The third place we wanted to expand was really in investing in workforce development among the communities most impacted in COVID. So um, this is not about um, investing in traditional um, agencies or in healthcare agencies. This is about seeding some funds for community health workers, cult sometimes they're called mm -hmm. cultural brokers, sometimes they're called community liaisons. Uh, but these are the folks who are actually of the community who are trusted um, community members who can work in collaboration with us in doing outreach education, setting up um, services. And then we also realized, um, as you probably have seen, we have really utilized our emergency medical services providers, and they recognize that they have a long way to go in recruitment and intention, retention of individuals who uh, represent and are of the communities most impacted. So this is all about the combination of uh, reinforcing our, um, our current activities and making sure that we have invested in the workforce in a way that brings uh, more people representative of the community into that work. The second area is increasing and improving data collection and reporting. Um, some of this um, relates very much to some legislation. Perhaps you all were involved in it. I forget where it originated. Uh, we had a, a report that we had to provide on ways in which we were expanding our data collection uh, in the department uh, and supporting the collection of race and ethnicity data and some others. Well, what we to totally found out is that um, we had to scurry um, during COVID uh, to make sure that we were connecting uh, our data within the health department across the Agency of Human Services, and then of course across our health information exchange. So we have uh, put in some funding uh, for the infrastructure and the individuals to help us connect, broaden, 
and connect our reporting on essential data on race, ethnicity, and preferred language. So that's both in the um, Vermont Health Information Exchange, data systems across the Agency of Human Services, and then we uh, used a lot of dashboarding, and hopefully they have been useful to you, uh, where we've been uh, trying to make really e more easily um, accessible data for the public that tracks COVID over time. The other big thing that we realized is that um, we don't actually understand all the community impacts and needs. Historically, the health department and our sister agencies have done what we call community health needs assessments. And these are generally place-based assessments. So we learn a lot about a geography, but when we go with geography rather than subpopulation, even our small numbers in Vermont, we often um, don't get really great data on the populations of concern. Um, and so what we did was we put aside some funding uh, in here so that we can do some community needs assessments with the population. So we have a bunch of funding that we hope to uh, do some joint inquiry and or provide funding to community organizations to do their own inquiry around what are the health impacts and the health needs of our BIPOC, ELL, LGBTQ, older adults and rural Vermonters. Um, and so that we would really give them work in partnership to look at what are the impacts, what are the needs of these communities and therefore how do we jointly inform our work moving forward. So that, that's a lot of what we're hoping to do with our data uh, collection and reporting to inform how we can move forward to address um, persistent inequities. The third strategy is around building infrastructure. So first uh, infrastructure, we, as I mentioned, we were stabilizing our staff and our departments. Um, some of you may have heard about our extraordinary health equity and engagement team that we had to stand up uh, in a moment in our health operations center. Uh, when the health department moved into emergency mode, um, as you probably know, we all got plucked out of our regular jobs and put into different positions. Um, at, to serve the emergency, um, we learned pretty quickly that we needed a special unit in that that was focused on equity and community engagement. So we pulled staff from their regular jobs to stand this up, and we pulled, and then we also brought on some temporary staff. What we know now is, oops, so sorry, is that we need to formalize that team. So we've created some positions. We're in the middle of hiring right now for a, a more permanent, semi-permanent. So for the two years of the grant anyway, that we can stabilize those positions so that we have some staff who can address um, health equity and community engagement. We invest in staff for communication. We've done a tremendous amount of work and there remains some uh, communication both for translation and interpretation for our English language learning communities, but also uh, helping ourselves and our sister agencies understand about plain language use uh, and effective communication to smaller populations. Um, we had added a couple of staff to help us with our data. And then we also added one person uh, to help us work on our own internal workforce um, cultural competency. Second place that we looked at building some infrastructure was, as I said, really working on improving access to culturally and linguistically appropriate uh, information. So we have on our website for translation. And then we have also been funding, uh, it used to be called the Multilingual Task Force. This is an extraordinary group that, cert that sort of just self-organized uh, during the pandemic, um, led by initially a staff member over at the Howard Center who's now uh, moved over to CCTV. And they have founded what they're calling the Vermont Language Justice uh, Project. And they have been extraordinary. Uh, as a resource for not only translating, um, they haven't been doing written translations. What they have been doing is creating amazing little videos in 10 to 15 different languages using mm -hmm. native speakers to be able to communicate everything COVID. Um, and so we have invested in uh, that for the next two years and we would be sunk without that group. And, uh, it's our hope that, that um, our funding for this group will live, will create um, enough stability for them to find continued funding 
through uh, partners in uh, both in state government, but in our healthcare system, they are providing a tremendous service. Um, and then the last area that we intend that um, CDC strategy was mobilizing partners and collaborators to advance equity and address uh, the determinants of health. So there are two different ways that we're looking at this. One is we're looking at um, what I'm calling investing in community health improvement. Prior to COVID, we actually had some traction in two different ways. One is we've been working in partnership through what we called our healthy community design work uh, in partnership with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, uh, the Agency of Transportation, AARP, and others on place-based grant making to create healthier communities. So really communities that are designed to promote health and wellness. We intend to invest some of the funds to um, with that partnership and have asked them that the funding we give be specifically used for community partners or community projects that are focused on our black, indigenous, uh, people of color, our English language learners, uh, LGBTQ and, and rural areas. We also um, are reinvesting in what we're calling our community collaboratives. Um, Pre-pandemic, once upon a time, uh, we actually had some fairly vibrant community collaboratives where public health was sort of at the center connecting on one side our healthcare system, meaning our hospitals, our healthcare system through the blueprint for health, um, through the ACO and our health department, really looking at investments in population health at the community level. At the same time, our health department was reaching out more with uh, local planning, um, municipalities, and then the partners that I mentioned before, ACCD, BTRANS, and ARP, to try and say, how do we look at population health investment. And so uh, part of what we are investing in with this grant is to remobilize those partnerships. Because remember, while COVID is the issue right now, um, what we know is the next wave is gonna be mental health, substance use and suicide um, that we're keeping our eyes towards. And so having that integration with our healthcare and mental health system is super important. The second piece of um, mobilization is establishing grants directly to community-based organizations. So while the former one is gonna go through our district offices and through some health and human service organizations, we also have established a grant program that's going to be upwards of $5 million that is going to go directly to community-based organizations. We had really hoped to get this money out the door far sooner than we have been able to. Um, as I said, we were not able to get spending authority until November. We had uh, really been working diligently with two organizations to try and figure out uh, if we could use work with them as intermediaries so that they could help us create a fair and equitable grant system um, that was less burdensome to community partners. Uh, and that fell apart last, last, in the last within the last month uh, in that, um, as you probably know, um, it is no easy job to set up a grant and system or move uh, federal and state funds to community organizations for some very good reasons. But it also means that unless you already have an established relationship with the department or the agency, and you already have certain high levels of insurance and you have certain 5031 status and you have their multiple layers, then you are not going to be able to um, partner with us. And so we're trying very hard to get around that and not have to go out through a request for proposal process through the state. Uh, but that is now where we're at. We are getting ready to do our request for proposal process um, out to community partners. Um, we hope to launch that within the next month, probably realistically April. Um, for to be able to that to be able to um, provide some investment in community-based organizations. Again, remember who are of and and led by our Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ, uh, and rural communities, so that they can launch whatever programs or services uh, they feel are needed to address the COVID impacts. 
Here's a list of some of the things that CDC has said are allowable, data gathering, community health workers, outreach and education, promotional efforts that are culturally, linguistically appropriate, education and training for public health, social service providers, et cetera, and then some wealth, wellness and healing programming. This is a non-clinical grant. I'm gonna come back and stop sharing, I think, because I am done with my uh, presentation. I don't know if I did that right. Am I back? You're back. All You're right. Back. Um, so just so that you know, the way that the CDC grant was set up, it is, it's a prevention grant. It's a public health investment grant. Uh, we are not allowed to use it for investments in healthcare services. Um, there are different streams of funding that are available to our healthcare partners. Uh, we hope and we know, and therefore um, this, the grant funding here will not be used for that. Uh, so that was my long and complicated hopefully not too onerous, uh, presentation of what the CDC grant is like. We are, um, it, it's massive for us. We have um, probably 15 different um, activity leads working in partnership um, throughout the Agency of Human Services with the Agency of Digital Services. And then of course, all the work that we're doing with multiple community partners that will be funded through this. Um, it's a pretty, big undertaking we are hearing while that um, the formal date for spending is by the end of May, 2023. In conversations with our project officers at the CDC, um, we have been told that we, they know that we and all of our other counterparts throughout um, the United States are having a hard time um, meeting that deadline. Um, and so they are looking to uh, see if they are going to be able to extend the deadline. Um, and allow a new cost extension. But for now, we're operating as if it is through the end of May, 2023. Great. Well, thank you, Heidi. This is a, I mean, as I first heard about it and hearing about it more, this is a very exciting and a very uh, well-funded uh, initiative. Um, one, one of the things I'm, I'm very interested in is given that we established the Vermont Health Equity Advisory Commission last year. Can you talk to us about the intersection and the work that you're doing to use them and to work with them collaboratively? Because it seems like there's huge opportunities uh, and overlap uh, in terms of the, the very kinds of uh, having set up a commission that is made up of many of the same communities that your grant is focused on, uh, what, what is the relationship there? I'm hoping there is a robust relationship. Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, you may hear the name Sarah Chesbro. Uh, Sarah Chesbro is the health department uh, staff member who has been assigned to be the collaborator on um, the Health Equity Advisory Commission. Sarah was the one who got called, popped out of her position in our maternal and child health division and asked to be the lead, our initial lead on health equity within our COVID response. And so she was able to meet and know many of the partners who are part of the commission. And so she's been working with um, Director Davis um, from the beginning. Um, Director Davis also is uh, attends now our health equity team meetings internally at the health department so that she's aware of what we're doing. Um, and then the third piece is um, we have invited her to be part of a learning uh, project that we have going on. Uh, we got, uh, we are part of what's called STRETCH and I'm never gonna remember what it stands for, but it's a uh, opportunity that is uh, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the CDC Foundation um, to over the next two years to be able to look at um, how we embed equity into our state health operations. So we invited um, Director Davis to be part of that so that there would be an intersect with the work that she's leading. More directly, um, I know one of the pieces that um, the commission had, had been asked to consider was um, bringing community voice to uh, grant making decisions, yes. right? Um, we have been out of sync in terms of timing because of the way the CDC funds came and the way that the 
the the startup of the commission. It was just sort of, as you know, uh, everything just sort of came in in a disjointed way. So we've been trying to rectify that. Sarah um, Chesbury, our representative on the commission, um, asked to head up and the there's a subcommittee that's specifically looking at grants and funding. Um, and each of the committee members were asked to join a subcommittee. And so our hope is that that subcommittee actually is going to, uh, members of that subcommittee will serve both as the developer reviewer of the RFP process that we're gonna use, as well as, <coughs> excuse me, as well as serve on the review of any of the proposals that come in so that we would not be making those decisions except as informed by and advised by the, the commission. Um, so we that assistance, yeah. That's specifically referring to the $5 million in grants that are going out into the communities because it seems <laughs> there's a huge opportunity there to empower the commission to have a voice in uh, using their experience to inform that part of the federal grant. Exactly. It didn't make sense for, for, for us. It seemed like the commission was exactly the right host of individuals um, to be able to help us. The one challenge is that because we have to go through an RFP process, <coughs> excuse me, we, we need, um, there may be some conflict of interest that the commission members need to think about um, in terms of being part of the development team or the the grant review team, if they are also wanting to apply for grants. And so that's something that Sarah is gonna be working to figure out with them, how to, uh, to move through that. I'm very grateful that HB Lozado um, has offered to um, partner with us specifically in, in navigating these, um, these waters so that we're best able to ensure that we have community voice on that RFP process. Um, I do think that one of the other things that we are really hoping the commission will do because we have been stymied. Um, I think one of the, they have been very focused and as the legislation is focused is on how to get community voice in uh, the decision-making around grant making. And one of the pieces that I, I did not understand a year ago that I have a much better appreciation for now is the internal barriers we have in state government in being able to provide granting to very small community-based organizations. So for example, right now, we can only provide grants in a way that, as I said, that meets certain, like the organization has to have certain infrastructure in order to be able to receive funding. Many of them don't. So what we have done is partnered them with another larger organization to serve as a fiscal agent that has more capacity is willing to offer up their accounting systems because when we put out money into any organization, as you can imagine, to safeguard the public's funding, we have incredibly high levels of reporting, tracking, auditing, and that is really onerous for some of our smallest organizations and the ones who really are working most closely with the communities that are impacted. The other thing, so our, our reporting, it's huge, cumbersome grant making. Second thing that we have discovered, <coughs> excuse me, is um, at least within the Agency of Human Services, we can only provide funding after we have been billed. So it's on a reimbursement basis only. That is a huge barrier to an organization to be able to participate with us if they are on a reimbursement only process, because that means they have to ride forever, however long, paying their staff, paying their community members or asking those staff and community members to work for free until we are able to reimburse them. So inherently it's inequitable. So when I look at what the charge is to the advisory committee, like. That is the bigger hurdle for us in terms of being able to move to equity and grant making is figuring out how we look at, are there ways in state government or through public private partnership that are different to enable the kind of equity and grant making that I think 
was imagined in the development of this commission. Um, we are committed over, we as the health department are committed in the next two years to work with um, uh, the agency of administration with uh, Director Davis and also with the Vermont Community Foundation and the Vermont Public Health Institute through this learning collaborative uh, and hope to see if we can find what's how other states are dealing with it, how other programs outside the health department are dealing with this and what traction we can make because this has been the, the number one impediment um, in our COVID response and in working with this grant. Uh, and it will be the impediment to the intentions of the Health Equity um, Advisory Committee. Yes, it seems like that's that is, it's a very, uh... It's, it's the epitome of systemic barriers to equity, uh, that, that there are rules that in fact keep the very community that has been disenfranchised and marginalized to keep them marginalized by not by saying, well, you, we can't give you money because in fact, we've never given you money. And because we've never given you money, you don't have the structure that allows us to give you money. It's, it's a circular, it's a circular systemic, uh, uh, system of exclusion that's why it's called systemic yes exactly that's why it's called systemic and i i it, it's 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 uh Boy. It, it must it you know there must be ways to overcome this and it's interestingly enough it did occur to me that and i think the vermont community foundation possibly i mean i don't speak for i would couldn't possibly speak for them but having worked with them over the years sometimes they can more flexibly leverage some philanthropic dollars to uh, sometimes provide a bridge. Uh, I don't know that, that I, I, I have no, no basis to say that at all other than. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, that's exactly why we partnered with them too, um, is to try and learn from how they've been able to uh, work in other ways and, and over the long haul, is there a way for us to work with them in uh, uh, private philanthropy to set up something because our hands really are quite tied uh, given state and federal regulations. So I'm also interested, I, I'm, I'm just gonna use this opportunity to ask a few questions that I've been wanting to ask and I'm not meaning to cut off other committee members, but the, there's such an overlap between our committees, our committee, the House Healthcare Committees, uh, take trying to take initiative and give support around data collection and cleaning up uh, the expectations, having data that's actually uh, matches the realities of uh, health care disparities and health inequities so that you collect data uh, that's actually useful data. And I know that uh, uh, Director Davis has, uh, we provided some, some support to her office and others to try to work on that very issue. So I, I'm just hoping that we are, that there's not parallel initiatives happening with this grant and with other initiatives that we, prior to this grant, we, we tried to support and set in motion uh, because it, it, we, we supported them and the Office of Racial Equity because they, in fact, are the uh, voices of the community who uh, have a lens that shows what needs to change and, and how it needs to be spread throughout the healthcare system. So we collect actual data that's useful. Are you, is, is this grant collaborating with Director Davis on the data collection issue as well? Absolutely. I mean, this is one of those things where at times where it's really nice that Vermont is so small. <laughs> and really we are like all of government is so small. So yeah, so um, Jesse Hammond, who's our uh, Director of Public Health Statistics is working very close um, with um, Director Davis um, as well as the team within the Agency of Human Services that is also quite committed to improving the data that is both collected, so collected, analyzed, and reported. It's all three layers there, right? Um, and so uh, Jesse's <clears throat> team is pretty much the backbone from a public health and healthcare perspective. Um, and we'd be happy, um, Susanna and I have been talking about all the connections. So um, we will not be recreating the wheel, but rather uh, ensuring that we are complementary in the data that we're, that we're collecting in the systems that we set up. Great. 
And uh, lastly, it, it occurs to me the conflict of interest issue is one that must be able to be addressed and has to have been encountered elsewhere because it's it's hard to impanel members of the affected community and then say, oh, you can't apply or there's a, you have a conflict to apply for the very money that we've invited you to help us to help advise us so that we can have the appropriate advice from the affected community. But now there's a conflict. So it's a catch. It's a catch I guess. I think there are ways that one can recuse themselves from certain conversations for sure. Um, I will say I did ask um, Sarah Chesbrough to reach back out because when she, when the committee members first signed up for various um, subgroups, only one committee, only one committee member who represented a community-based organization chose to be part of that. Um, and so, um, so Sarah and Director Davis and I are going to hook up together and see how we can improve on that uh, because it really isn't community voice right now. Um, and as I said, it was only HB Lozado who, uh, who signed up to work with us directly. Uh, and so we have some work to do to make sure it really is uh, inclusive of more voices. And this is the subcommittee of your grant that you're referring to or the subcommittee of the, of the commission? Of the commission, because we thought, why why create a, a different advisory panel if the commission already existed? Exactly. It's, it seems like the commission, the, in fact, indeed, indeed, the commission was proposed for these very, to, to be useful and empowering of the community, affected communities to actually uh, look for opportunities. And here's an opportunity that's like a huge opportunity that needs to be taken full advantage of from from my point of view. Um, I thank you. I've indulged myself. <laughs> Let me open it up to questions from uh, others. Representative, uh, Representative Page. That's quite all right, uh, Chair. Um, I have a, a, a different tact I want to uh, ask a question about. Since you're the refugee health coordinator, um, how are you going to help, or how is these grants going to help expand uh, the health care, I guess, for Afghan refugees that are that are coming to Vermont. Is that something that you're you're working on? Um, particularly when we've never had Afghan uh, refugees here. So how can you actually expand upon that? Right. Well, um, actually there have been a couple of changes. Um, so as you know, we have a new director of um, refugee services is that overall um, our former commissioner deputy um, our former deputy commissioner Tracy Dolan is now working within the AHS secretary's office as the director of refugee services uh, and she took with her our one position for refugee health coordinator so that work is now placed uh, directly within the uh, secretary of the agency of human services um, and the the work of um, on um, setting up medical services and supports for our new Afghani neighbors is being handled out of the secretary's office and not through the health department. Um, we, the, this particular funding stream, the CDC health disparities funding stream will be used um, continue as it was before in reaching out with our um, community-based refugee partners, meaning USCRI, AALB, and now the ECDC. I think that's what it is, is the Economic Community. That was a string of letters. <laughs> right? Of Sorry, so USCRI is, uh, used to be called the Refugee Resettlement Organization in Vermont. They're now, I don't even know what USCRI stands for. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, AALB, is the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, but they serve well beyond any Africans. They have been our amazing on the ground folks uh, who have set up uh, interpretation services and support services for English language learners throughout the state. And now there's a new partner in town, um, the Economic Community Development Corporation, I think is what they're called down in Brattleboro. So they are a small emerging organization that is being set up to receive and support the Afghani um, efforts, resettlement efforts. Um, and so the agency secretary's office through the through um, Tracy Dolan is supporting that work. Um, 
and Medicaid will be used in the beginning to support some of their work. We will always be involved in the prevention world, but in terms of healthcare services and supports, uh, that's really in the secretary's office at this point. I'm not sure if that answered your question sufficiently. Okay, uh, Representative Goldman. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about community health workers and you know sort of what their role is and who pays them and if you could give examples of work that they do. Sure, sure. So um, it's a big question. <laughs> Um, Vermont is one of, from what I understand, Vermont is one of the last states in the nation to not have a formal community health worker system and supports, just so you know. Um, in most other states, when um, the Affordable Care Act was started, most states got on board and established a community health worker program that was taking advantage of some of the federal funds through the Accountable Care Act. Um, and through Medicaid to create um, a level of uh, training and service for people to work in primarily in healthcare settings as community liaisons, right? Mm -hmm. So these are individuals who are not necessarily trained in healthcare, but work in concert with healthcare organizations and professionals mm -hmm. to. Um, work with it, whether individual clients or particular populations so that those populations and clients understand um, how to access the healthcare system and how to access other services that are health promoting or how to understand um, information that is being uh, created and delivered perhaps not in their first language. So in Vermont, we have had a tradition of community health workers but not a, a system, right? And so through this grant, we are helping to support the creation of a system. So we're gonna be working with the Area Health Education Center, AHEC at UVM, that has been an amazing partner in creating a pipeline for new um, healthcare professionals. And they are very interested in supporting a coordinated approach to establishing healthcare workers that could be everything from um, what some might know in, in the international world, uh, promotores, which are um, health promotion specialists, people who live in a particular community who get mm -hmm. a modicum of training um, and then serve as a cultural broker, cultural liaison, community health worker, all those words intermixed, right? All the way up to, uh, so that would be the lesser amount of training and really community-based versus the embedding someone in say in an FQHC. So like the Community Health Center in Burlington has done an amazing job of funding staff in uh, the wow. FQHC um, to specifically provide um, navigation services, right? Healthcare navigation services, because many people uh, may not be aware of how one gets insurance, what it means to go to a primary care versus a specialist and how to interpret what your doctor told you. So it's sort of the full range. I don't know if that, if that uh, I could, if you're interested, we do have a staff member here um, who has been leading efforts for the last few years, pre-COVID uh, to try and, and pull together what is now a pretty robust network of organizations interested in the community health worker model and creating something more um, long-term. Uh, one of the big issues is we are going to fund a little bit through this grant but the, the, the big um, hope is that eventually that uh, community health workers be funded through a routine funding source, such as healthcare insurance, um, whether it be public or private, um, so that it's not grant funded because grant funded positions come and go. Well, I'd like to know more about that because it's, we've been spending a lot of time on the healthcare workforce and this sort of role has not come up. Um, it sounds like they don't have sort of an official degree. It's more of an on the job kind of training if I'm understanding that right. Does that sound right? It can be. We are also working to establish a certificate program through CCV. So okay. it's, a, it's a development now. It is a essential component of what's missing in our healthcare system um, overall. And I think what we know is pre-pandemic, there was with the accountable 
care organization and communities for health, there was a lot of talk about the need for navigators and social workers connected to healthcare systems because that was a way of connecting people more effectively into healthcare services. Um, some, so that's a, sort of that same idea as embedding a human being connected to other human beings who share an understanding. So there, there was a little bit of that through our pandemic response, we would have been lost without the cultural broker program at the UVM LEND program, who worked with many of our non-English speakers. Um, as I mentioned, um, ALV, USCRI, those, those, those on the ground folks who um, were doing the outreach communication and sometimes hosting, testing, or vaccination clinics were essential. Yeah, if we could learn more about that, I think that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions here? President Peterson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I assume this grant went to all states and, and it was allocated based on population, total population or? Yeah, I think it was primarily based on population. I think you're right. And it was one of those we were told how much money was coming to us. Uh, and it was based on a, um, a legislative appropriation in Congress. Okay, and it, I'm looking at the slide that you had, it needs to be spent by May 31st, 2023. Okay, just wanted to clarify it, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna be working really hard to spend that money. This is why we're really hoping, fingers crossed that we get that no cost extension because it has been very hard to spend that money as fast as we would like to. Uh, I have one last question and that is, was this grant, did this grant include, when you talked about the infrastructure, did this grant include the establishment of a director of health equity in the Department of Health? Very good question. In fact, it did. Um, we, so as I, there was one slide where I talked about um, needing to shore up our infrastructure. So um, what we did is we took, we looked at what did we need to temporarily stand up in the health operations center, meaning our HOC emergency response, and how do we create a unit that um, has that responsibility over time uh, and can make sure that whatever we learned from COVID is applied in our future work. And so there is a small unit in the, um, commissioner's office. Um, I am that right now that unit is reporting to me in planning. Um, and we do have a director of health equity and community engagement who started all of last Monday. Or well, I should say, yeah, last Monday, she started with us. Um, and so she, her position will outlive the CDC grant because the health department has made a, a commitment to keeping that one position and we know we can. Uh, some of the other positions we're gonna, if we, if and when we run out of the CDC funding, we will search to ensure that we can continue them some other way. Um, but right now, they are dependent on the CDC grant. And can you introduce us by name to the person who's? Oh, sure. Out? Her name is her name is Ashley Craybill. Uh, I can send you her bio if you want. Um, she <laughs> she's in that. Um, drinking from a, a fire hose moment uh, on onboarding um, in the state. Um, but we were really happy to have her because she came to us having led very similar efforts uh, in Wisconsin, in the Madison-Dane County Health Department, and then also in the Wisconsin Department of Health, um, where she had to look at how do you use the tools and levers of state government to advance equity um, and so she comes less with a community engagement um, background, although she did quite a bit of that. She really comes strongly with internal systems change for state government, which is what we have realized we need to, to be able to invest in as well. Of course, establishing a position of director of health equity was an issue as we were establishing the commission. And we were, so again, I'm hoping that there might be some way that the commission uh, and that position can be involved in trying to see whether that position complements and works with the desire to have a director of health equity uh, as we yeah. 
as we determined wasn't possible to do during the midst of the pandemic, but this grant has suddenly yeah. made it possible. I, so. I do think if I could just add one more thing, Representative Lipper, to that, and that is, I was very hopeful that the commission would be also looking beyond what looking at does it need to live in the health department or does the health department need a director of health equity and it also needs to be elsewhere right because one of the things that was why i took the time to show you my crazy graphic about what contributes to health outcomes mm -hmm. the health department alone cannot solve inequities it needs the power and the backing of all of state government and all sectors of government and inside and out. So I do think it is still worth the exploration of what how other states are set up and where their Office of Health Equity sits because it's often not in the health department. Um, and it's often not called an Office of Health Equity. It's, it's equity and justice and it's looking across the intersection because the roots of inequities for health are the same as the roots of the inequities in education and in environmental justice. I mean, it's the same. And so I think that one of the opportunities for us is really to just think about, uh, is it an either or yes and, as we think about where we need to have capacity and leadership to address structural inequities. Great, well, I appreciate that. And I think that that's something still to be engaged with as the commission matures in its work. And one of the one of the statutory issues was that they think clearly or and recommend whether there should be a director of health equity inside of state government or external to state government. And so that try, trying to trying to fix, meld all these initiatives together is is going to take some time. But I I thought I understood there was a position that had been created, and uh, now I understand that it's been filled. Okay. Um, well, let me see. Is there anyone else that has a question? I mean, just, just to make sure we get heard if they wish to. Okay, one last question, then we're going to take a break and we're going to come back to some other work. Well, you may decide this question isn't appropriate for now, and then I totally understand. <laughs> um, and it may not be our jurisdic jurisdiction, but Heidi, you did mention the issue of the health department being starved. And I'm just wondering what the thoughts. You know, what's happening with that prop with that idea and that problem? Yeah, I really appreciate um, you're asking that. I uh, don't know right now. Um, I think we are incredibly grateful that um, we within there are some bright, you know, sort of the the silver linings of COVID, right? Are the recognition uh, that we need public health infrastructure. Uh, that had been eroding. And so we're very grateful to be able to reinforce some of our work, particularly as you all know, um, COVID has let us know it's here, it's going to remain here, and we don't wanna be caught by surprise, whatever's next. Um, the second thing that COVID, silver lining with COVID was about shining a light on the, the persistence and systemic inequities that we can no longer ignore. So between those two pieces, I do hope that we are gonna be able to continue working on this. Um, and we of course appreciate any support that you all might be able to um, offer in connecting with us and um, making sure that our good work continues to be able to move forward. Thank you. And, and just in terms of the legislature structure, the House Healthcare, or the House Human Services Committee is generally uh, taking the lead on public health and staffing around public health. Although we certainly have a strong interest in this committee room as well. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you for taking the time to answer the questions that uh, I and others have posed. I'm um, happy to do so and happy to follow up to any time. I really appreciate the leadership of this, um, this this committee and the opportunity to share what we're doing. And um, I will make sure that we are firmly connected with uh, Director Davis as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Take care. Uh, let's, uh, let's go off live, and then let's take a break, and then we're going to come back.